All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our October call. Uh, on behalf of all the foot nerds at TFC and all of our teams at TFC, thank you for being here and being part of our global family. My name is Nick. Uh, I'm one of the leaders here at TFC, um, and Ruth is the quarterback that makes all this happen. So thank you, Ruth. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to uh, actually, Ruth already kind of mentioned it for everyone that's here just to mute themselves to avoid any unwanted background noise. Um, so we're going to start with a quick note about the mission at TFC and our values. Uh, Ruth is then going to make a couple of announcements about foot nerds who have graduated their training uh, recently. Um, then I'm going to talk about the golden rules and aromas. And we can uh, then open up the floor to any questions. Um, and I know Ruth has a bunch of questions from the community of people that aren't here. So we'll have plenty of stuff there. But uh, as always, people who have tuned into the call get priority in terms of asking questions. We can't give personal advice, but we will do our best to answer uh, every, que every question asked with either a better question or um, refer to some of the really powerful heuristics that we use um, and principles. So this is going to be a 60 minute call. Uh, we'll be wrapping up at 2.30 Eastern and we're going to upload this to TFC's YouTube uh, within a couple of days. So, so TFC is the Foot Collective, AKA TFC is a global health network focused on feet. And as a business, we build digital tools that serve the network. And we also sell physical tools from our global stores. And that includes natural footwear and you know, balance equipment. Um, and our mission is really simple at TFC. It's to empower people to restore healthy feet. And our values are love, health, integrity, uh, and truth. And so that is what we stand for. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, Ruth is gonna start by announcing uh, some shout outs to foot nerds that have recently completed their training. Yes, so um, we wanna acknowledge some people in our foot nerd training program because it's sneaky rigorous and it's a 12, foot nerd training is a 12 week course that people um, enroll in. And the first six weeks is restoring our own foot health, similar to health kits, but we go deeper, uh, deeper dive in into that. And then the second, um, the second six weeks is um, the part where they learn how to teach what they have learned to other humans. So it could be as small as their friends and family, just uh, learning more deeply by teaching others. We, we find that that is it, the most powerful way to learn is by teaching others. And then, um, and it can be as big as events for, you know, hundreds of people. So, like I said, the program sounds sort of like doable and it is, but it is sneaky hard. And we really want to acknowledge the people that finish because it's not always um, a smooth path. So our two, the two people that have finished recently, the 12 week program are Dan Hill and Cameron Lussie. Dan Hill is um, from Maryland in the United States. And I have to say a little bit about him because he's a pretty, I mean, words really can't do justice what he has done, but he's a disabled veteran. He's a physical therapist, a personal trainer, a yoga teacher, and most importantly, he is the ta a tamer of tiny humans, otherwise known as a father to a small girl. And he, one of the things that he is on a mission to do is, and he does, is he provides free services to um, veterans and their families, and they, they provide a personal training um, personal physical therapy, counseling. And then he all, I get a little choked up, <laughs> excuse me. But he also um, is involved with teaching, uh, providing teacher trainings for veterans who want to become teachers. So he just recently finished the 12 week uh, foot nerd training and he's doing a fantastic job of just teaching people about barefoot awareness and the health and what it means to um, live a healthy life from the feet up. And then we have another, we have another, excuse me, I'm just going to let somebody in. We have another foot nerd who is Cameron Lessie. Cameron Lessie is from Winnipeg, Canada. And he is, he started in our year long program, the foot nerd experience, which covers six pillar health. So we cover food, sleep, mindfulness, movement, community, and financial literacy. And he, so a lot of our foot nerds, um, you know, stay 
and takes a long time to finish because it's it's a very deep training. And so he switched over to the 12 week uh, program and he did a hybrid type of uh, program that is like really designed for him and he finished recently so we want to shout out to him and then he's been able to create a podcast for himself he's starting his own business and he finished foot nerd training and so that's amazing so we want to say congratulations to them awesome cam and dan cam and dan <laughs> well done Alrighty. so we're going to talk about the golden rules, and this is actually uh, the first public forum uh, that this has been discussed, but it's going to be a really big part of what we do at the Foot Collective. It's sort of the evolution in our clarity, um, and the golden rules are our five most powerful heuristics, which are just like rules of thumbs, principles, standards, um, and we feel they're the keys to healthy feet. So they're simple uh, because we feel simple enables action. Simple doesn't always mean easy, um, but simple holds us accountable because we can't hide from it. Um, I think a lot of times we distract ourselves with the novelty of really a lot of complexity, and it can take away from just the simple things that when done consistently yield amazing results. Um, and so we're upgrading HealthKit, and essentially HealthKit is what helps people in implement the golden rules. And then foot nerd training is what helps people um, teach the golden rules, essentially through proof of work education. So. We're going to go through these five rules. Um, I'm going to list them off. They're very simple. And then before we get into neuromas, I'd actually love to just hear if there's any feedback from anyone on the golden rules. Uh, we won't discuss it too much because we do want to get to neuromas and have Q&A, but um, we can kind of have them open for discussion uh, for a little session here. So rule number one, wear natural footwear and spend time barefoot. Now time barefoot might literally only be inside the house, but just spend some time with no footwear on your feet and wear natural footwear. That's rule number one. It's very simple. Um, the sort of extension to that is also gradually eliminate unnatural footwear over time. And we define natural and unnatural footwear in health kit. And um, it's a very simple heuristic, the four F's. So it's flat, a shoe that's flat, foot shaped, flexible, and allows you to feel the ground. Those are the four F's. That's rule number one. Rule number two, become capable of getting into a resting squat position for two minutes comfortably. Um, now I won't go super into detail in all the nuance of all these things, cause that'll take a lot longer. Um, but we will go into detail in uh, health kit and in our future content through TFC. So rule number two is become capable of getting into a resting squat position for two minutes comfortably. And if you can't work towards it every day until you can rule number three, become capable of standing on one foot barefoot with your eyes closed for 60 seconds without making an error. And if you can't. Work towards it every day until you can. That's rule number three. Rule number four, limit the amount of time you spend every day sitting in a chair to four hours or less. And if you are sitting in a chair, get up and move every 30 minutes. Okay, that's rule number four. And the last rule, and this is a really big one because this is really a, the mindset element of um, but essentially implementing the first four golden rules. And golden rule number five is adopt a long-term mindset. So... Um, really the objective is to get a little bit better every day and really just to trust the process and show up every day. It doesn't actually matter what you do, but do something to, to bring you further towards healthy feet every day by making progress on the golden rules. And that could literally be standing on one leg for 60 seconds to work on your balance. It could be go for a, go stand on a patch of grass barefoot. Like it, it can be very small, but those are the five golden rules. And like I said, those are going to be really our main heuristics, because I think they're action oriented and they are the fundamental truths of what one needs to do to restore healthy feet. I know it sounds absurdly simple, but the reality is having healthy feet is absurdly simple. Um, and it's more about the things you're not doing than the things you need to do. So by not wearing unnatural footwear, by not sitting in a chair for huge periods of time, um, and by not um, avoiding correcting like fundamental things like balance and your basic ability to get into a squat position, you're going to do really well, especially if you adopt a long-term mindset. So those are the five golden rules. Love to open it up for maybe like 10 minutes. If anyone has questions or wants to discuss or ask more, you know, deeper questions about a specific golden rule, um, go for it if you do. I have some questions, please. Yes, go for it, Lisa. Um, so I came to TXC during the lockdown period where I did some of your seminars and things. So I do wear barefoot shoes now my favorite will be the five finger shoes 
Um, one of my questions for tonight was going to be, and I think you've kind of answered it, is I really love um, treatments like reflexology and I like to feel, you know, I like to massage the bottom of my feet and I like to feel all the nerve endings and the feelings that you get from, um, from that. Um, but you tend to suggest in your course that, you know, actual naked barefoot walking is important. Um, so, and almost like the bottom of your feet should be like a callus. It should be really hard like the bottom of your shoe and my question is is that really important or is walking in barefoot shoes enough and and what is the difference what is that the importance of actually going naked barefoot that's a really good question um so i think I, one thing i've stopped saying and uh, um is barefoot shoes because i think it confuses people not that people shouldn't say i know what you're talking about um, but to, to the uninitiated people who don't really understand the difference, I think natural footwear, uh, is a good term because it really just says footwear that allows your feet to function naturally. So to answer your question, I think if you're wearing natural footwear and actually the, the most important thing, even it's highly related to this, but not the exact same is eliminating unnatural footwear over time. That is actually more, the more important part, which is kind of like an implied assumption with wear natural footwear. But wearing natural footwear is, um, I would say like, it's good enough. There's always good, better, best. If you get rid of the unnatural footwear, that's the best, which means you are wearing natural footwear, but doesn't necessarily mean you're going barefoot. And I don't think you necessarily need to, although our feet really are designed to touch the ground and be these high, you know, if you want really high fidelity sensors, you have to expose the sensors to a really rich environment of texture. So do you have to walk around barefoot all the time? Certainly not. Um, if you wear natural footwear, you're going to be just fine. I think it is a fun experience that everyone should try. I don't think you have to push it by going on like intense surfaces like rocks or concrete. Like I do it way more than most people would. And I don't think anyone should be doing it as much as I am. I'm just the weirdo who likes to do it. Um, so yeah, it's not as important, but it is just something to, I think, experience. But if you get rid of the unnatural footwear and you're wearing natural footwear, um, you're going to be just fine because you're going to permit your foot to expose itself to load and to all the little juicy bits of mobility that come from um, uninhibited articulation of all the joints and parts of your foot, which there are so much of. Um, and reflexology is wonderful. I think the other thing too is like, I do reflexology by walking on a beach with rocks. Um, yeah, sure. And, and I don't think it negates the relationship that you can have with a reflexologist. I'm just saying that when you eliminate the thick soles, you get so many of those um, nutrient, like a hike barefoot is like a massage, a reflexology session, uh, a gym session, a loading session, a mobility session, right? Yeah. Um, just because you get all that, all those goodies. So does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Lovely. Thank you. Perfect. And I'd like to piggyback on that too, about like risk tolerance, right? So like one of the things about going um, barefoot, and I, this is what I notice in my work with people in person is that we have become so um we have become so accustomed to being inside and being super comfortable that we kind of have forgotten what it feels like to have our feet on the ground and like nick's talking about going on rocks but i'm talking about like just getting out of i have people that really don't even want to get out of their socks and put their feet on the grass so that the sensations that we're missing out on what it means to be human in this way. So we always talk about at TFC how a foot conversation is a whole body conversation. And it really does make a difference um, just by taking like tiny, small risks, like going barefoot in public or on the grass or, you know, just um, in bare leaves where maybe you don't know about the bugs underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. So I think there is a even a bigger conversation to be had around why don't we want to get our naked feet on the ground? So I just wanted to add to that. That's a good yeah. Point. And I mean, five fingers is about as close to naked as you can get when it comes to your feet. So uh, yeah. yeah, those are very, those are a very powerful shoe to restore foot health because of even just the layers of material that go between each toe acts as like a way, like a small amount of splay. And I find my to my foot is way more splayed out in five fingers than even a wide shoe, just because oh, it yeah. like facilitates that through the pockets. So it's kind of, yeah. kind of interesting. Shout out to Vibram. Awesome. Have one more, if it's possible. Yeah, one. yeah of course. So you you showed up. You have priority. So yeah. <laughs> 
um, I'm uh, your biggest fan. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of issues, uh, medical, like physical issues. So I had quite a serious knee injury when I was 22. I'm 52 now. I was in a full leg cast for eight months. Um, I had a knee reconstruction. So I cannot... I. I've not been able to do a squat since I can remember. And, you know, I, I've got quite, um, I think my knee to wall was about seven centimeters. So quite limited range of ankle dorsiflexion and a very limited squat. I mean, I could probably half squat, but my knee, um, I think flexion's about 120 on, a, on the best day. So what would you say to someone like that? It's quite sort of um, demoralizing sometimes to, look at everybody else being able to do it and knowing that with the greatest will in the world, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do like a resting um, full body weight squat. Um, so yeah, how do you motivate somebody like me? And um, just a kind of suggestion, I suppose, that could could we have like a, a, an experienced person, like one of the foot nerds as a buddy, um, to ask questions, you know, if you can't do something, can you modify it or can you do it differently or what would you do? Um, because I kind of find that it's it's lovely being able to speak to other members in the community, but sometimes they wouldn't know the answer to your questions. Right. Yeah. So I think one thing is um, it's very easy to compare ourselves relative to others. And I mean, that's what humans do. Um, but I think when it comes to, you know, the golden rule uh, about the squat, um, become capable of getting into a resting squat position for two minutes. And if you can't work towards it every day until you can. So the implied notion there is it really is just progress that, that, that is the goal, right? It is not whether you can do the thing or not, as if you can't then work towards it and you may not get there. Um, and I think this idea that the process is the point, just showing up and doing something because I, wherever you're at right now, you can most certainly make progress where your ceiling ends up being in terms of like what the most progress you can make is, uh, might be different than someone else's. But I think if we just focus on what can I do, what, what do I want to accomplish? Do I want to have more flexion in my knee? Um, and, and I think the reason I say that, even though it seems, sounds so mundane is like, when you know why the motivation to continue persevering to accomplish or get closer to that thing. Even if you don't get there, there is no there. Your there is different than everyone else's. Just the idea that you can do something to take action, to make progress and improve how resilient and mobile and strong your body is. That's the only comparison. So your comparison is, did I, am I slightly better than me yesterday? Um, and that takes time to like, you know, really reshift that focus because our tendency, like I said, is always, relative to other humans. Um, yeah. 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 And there is what is perfect. It's like, I think perfect is overrated to be quite frank. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just trying to get better. And so what we're going to try and do like foot nerds don't get, they get paid to do their own workshops. Like if they get people to come to a workshop, they will make, they have a peer to peer relationship with the people they're teaching. So it's hard for us to say, to ask foot nerds and, and to expect people to be available one-to-one -to, -one to help health kit members. Um, but what we are going to do is, you know, every year we're putting more effort and energy into understanding like, how can we improve this experience for people that are in health kit? How can we answer the nuanced questions that people have that, and, and do it in a, in a way that like is a good use of our energy. Um, but you know, doesn't dilute the fact that other people need to work and put their energy towards things that are important to make them income. So we're solving these problems and, and kind of working on how do we do this? And I think one thing we're going to do is pool up all the questions that are coming in from the community and do a monthly Q and a session with foot nerds. Um, and, and even the community call serves as a good place for that. But I think health kit deserves its own thing, like 60 minutes, once a month, we get all the questions from the community. We answer them as best as we can. And then that becomes a piece of content. That's part of health kit because to do it one-on-one, -on -one, you know, eventually we want to make it available so that people can do one-on-one -on -one coaching with a foot nerd. Um, but for the time being, I think collectively we can answer these questions for the health kit community and then put them out there. And, um, even in the next iteration of health kit, where we're going to base it more on the five, the, the golden rules instead of the screens, I don't think they're going to replace the screens, but they will be the focus. The screens will be an accessory tool to measure. Um, 
when we focus on the golden rules, we'll, uh, you know, Liz is the healthcare engineer that's working primarily on healthcare, And she had this great idea of beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Cause she's seeing that a lot of people in healthcare either fit into one of those three categories, right? Beginner is like, they're completely new to this. They're just getting started. The intermediate is someone who's tried some things, but doesn't know if they're doing the right things or not. And the advanced is they've been working on it for a while. They haven't quite cracked what they want to do. Uh, there's Liz. That's the master of my mind, what I'm talking about. Um, and they need just a little bit, you know, funnily enough, they think they need more complex stuff, but what they really usually need to do is just focus on the golden rules, <laughs> I think. And I mean, I'm clearly biased in this. I, you know, I want feedback from this, but really in my life, what I've found is that oftentimes when I search for more and more complexity, I just really have to revert back to the basics and be consistent and honest with myself. And that's why they're so simple because you can't hide from simple. Simple keeps you accountable. Um, but layering it like that and then offering options like, okay, golden rule number one for a beginner might look like this. Mm. Get a pair of natural shoes, step on grass once a week, barefoot or whatever it might be. Whereas the advance might be like, you know, start playing with uh, running in natural footwear or go on a long hike to build up your capacity and, and the, the density of your soul. So, so I think we're going to get a little bit more nitty gritty. We're going to get simpler because um, the screens were just too complex, but they were kind of our stepping stone to get to the golden rules. Um, but we're also going to, I think that monthly podcast, and we might even, um, we'll just have more people over time working on this, but I think we have a good sense of direction of how to address that question where it's, if we have questions, how do we get those answered? Um, and on our end, on TFC's end, how do we do that in an efficient way? That's a good use of our energy. Um, so yeah, we're working on it. Cool. Thank Absolutely. you. Lisa, and I can speak personally to like your situation and um, having like that feeling of despair when you want to be able to do something. Um, and yeah. I think that long term mindset, the fifth golden rule is really important and that we co go, we rotate through the beginner, the intermediate and the advanced. Right. So like recently, like Nick and I were uh, doing a whole thing on setbacks and playfulness. Like what is the um, radical clarity you have about why you want to get into a full squat? You know, like we want to get into a deep squat for certain reasons, but um, really the ultimate reason why is because you have a goal of wanting to like play with your dog or go for a run or like do something like use your body in the way that it was designed to be used and feel good doing it and then and then like the um idea of not comparing ourselves but knowing that there that you might you might think that you're the only person who's going through something like that but there are so many that you don't even realize and we don't because the digital platform is a little uh, disconnected we don't really we don't get to interact that much, but there are so many people who are like daily working with the different aspects of moving through where they want to get to on that scale. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, yeah. Also w one little nugget too, you know, every seven years, I, I believe I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty, pretty sure this is correct. Every seven years, every cell in our body essentially gets replaced. Yes. And so the idea that we often are told from the medical community, especially that you're going to have a ceiling on what you can do. Like you're going to have a limitation. You're, you're never going to be able to do this. You're going to be restricted here, blah, blah, blah. It's like, really, if I use my, if I go at this and really like care and engage and, and want to expose my body to real natural inputs, like, I don't think those, I don't think people that say that understand how much potential there is for the body to remodel itself based on mm -hmm. the inputs we give it. Right. Now, surely you have to make drastic yeah. changes in the inputs to have that change. You have to be consistent. But I think if you wanted it, you could get in a full, deep body weight squat at some point in your life if you wanted it bad enough. That would just be my opinion. And, mm -hmm. and by knowing that that is an option, and maybe it doesn't matter for you enough to do all the things to get to there, um, but just knowing that it's possible doesn't close that door ever, right? Mm -hmm. And it leaves it open-ended because I, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't want you to close that door. So no. yeah. Cool. And the one last thing I wanted to say, and I wanted to, cause we have Emily, Liz and Jason, who are all other foot nerds that might want to weigh in and say something about this. But like when we, um, you know, it, when we ad adopt, when we truly accept the first principles that our body is a self-organizing self-healing machine, and we trust ourselves first being able to recognize that we know our bodies best and that our our practitioners and our physical therapists and our doctors and the people we go to are on our team, but we trust ourselves first. And then 
we look to the other people outside of us. If we, uh, if we truly accept that our bodies are self-healing machines and you take what Nick's saying into consideration and you're not using uh -huh. just will to force yourself into a deep squat because you want to get there or something, but you allow your body to do what it's designed to do and give it the right inputs. I think that is absolutely true that we tend to export our trust to people who don't know our bodies as well as we should and could. And that's the reason for the experiments, yeah, is you mm -hmm. start to know your right. body um, much better. And also, is that the basis of like the set principle is like when you use your body uh, in a certain way, it will develop in a certain way. So you just have to experiment to discover the best way to use your body and keep doing it. Exactly. Julie, you, you know more about how the human, or uh, Lisa rather, you know more about how the body adapts than when I graduated physio school, <laughs> officially. <laughs> like, I know that sounds weird, but you know, that, that, that principle is so important in all of recovery and in all of health. And yet I was never told that after two years master's degree as a health professional, which is yeah. stunning, right? And when you know that, when you're armed with that and you know, have conviction that that is truth, it's like, wow. This thing yeah. is magnificent. I don't even know what this thing's capable of, but, uh, and yeah, that's, that's beautiful roots. Like trust yourself first, then look for others for advice. But if there's ever a conflict, trust yourself and, and trust this little, thing. Yes. Yeah. And those little experiments that you're talking about that you build trust, you build trust and your body is designed to receive instructions from just you anyway. So then you just literally start to become somebody else who, who knows what to do next. I think it's really yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I'm just recovering from shoulder surgery now as well. So it's been really interesting doing, I deliberately did the health kit at the same time because I knew I was going to be off work with the shoulder surgery, but it's been really interesting doing the experiments with the physio, you know, exercises I've been given and I'm doing proof of work. So I've got one side of my journal, proof of work of the foot stuff. And then the other side, the other page is, of work for my shoulder stuff and it, it does you know obviously works for every body part but it's been so interesting to do it that way right shall we talk about aromas oh my gosh i i I'm sorry. I thought we were like well into the Q and a yes. That's okay. I mean aromas right. aren't rocket science. They're pretty straightforward. <laughs> I think they're um no no sorry at all. That was great. Um I think and aromas are very common. And I think the word, most people don't actually know what an aroma means or what the mechanism is. Oddly enough, you might go to get an aroma treated and have some intervention uh, be done, but never actually know why is this thing happening? And if you're never told that, you can never really resolve it. Um, I mean, the cause of an aroma is not um, some sur sort of surgical or drug intervention. So the, the solution cannot possibly be that. Um, it can help in the short term, but neuromas are basically angry nerves that are being compressed. And so really the, only, the, the primary golden rule relevant here is rule number one, which is wear natural footwear, um, which gives you a wide enough forefoot to avoid compressing the nerves. Um, you know, a common neuroma is Morton's neuroma, which is between uh, the metatar the nerves that go between the metatarsals of your foot. I believe it's usually toes three and four. Uh, it's also called interdigital neuroma. All these fancy words really just means like your shoes aren't wide enough. It's compressing the bones of your foot between each of those bones is a nerve. The nerve uh, is getting irritated because it's being so compressed. The tissues around that nerve and the nerve itself um, thicken and get angry, takes up more space, is more easily compressed. And so the solution is just create more space between the bones of the foot by stopping that lateral compression force which is compressing the nerve. And so, you know, really with neuromas, if you try and eliminate the pain as your um, priority, you often allow yourself to continue doing the behavior that's making the issue, that's bringing the issue there in the first place and actually end up making it worse, right? That's what happens when you just focus on eliminating the pain. If you focus on eliminating the cause, then you listen to the pain, you get rid of the compressive footwear, um, you can do some things to open up the tissues of the foot, you know, toe spreaders to kind of open up the meta uh, toe spreaders, open up the space between the metatarsals, but also doing some fascial tissue work between the metatarsals can help as well. Just kind of loosen up. If you, if you almost picture like you have a fascia, um, a sock of fascia on top of your foot, going in there and releasing elements of the sock, releasing tension can create less compressive 
circumferential forces around your foot. So, you know, releasing your foot on a uh, the cross ball or a cork ball, or just getting in there and do, literally doing some massage with your own um, fingers or going to see a massage therapist, reflexologist, whatever it might be. So yeah, that's neuromas. Angry nerves that are being compressed. If you wear natural footwear, you give the bones of your foot enough space so that they don't compress the nerves. That's it. Nick, when we were talking about neuromas before, you said something that was like a big aha moment for me. Like when you were talking about like hyperstimulation, like how if you are working on this, and I think this is where some like, I talk to a lot of people with this type of um, condition and they get that despair feeling, like it comes back and they feel like they've gone back to square one. And then they think that the work that they've been doing on that foot is for naught. But then you were talking about um, if you switch to natural footwear, you do all the things, you follow the golden rules, and then you put your, you go to a wedding and you put your shoe in a pointy, fashionable shoe that you take off to dance at the wedding anyway. <laughs> and you wake up the next day and the pain is back as if you had had the original injury. So could you talk about that a little bit? Because that to me was like a key piece of information that I think people do not ever get. Yeah, you become more sensitive to pressure, to lateral compression pressure, because when the nerve gets irritated, the nerve and the tissues around the nerve will actually develop like a bulb, like a callus, and it'll actually thicken. And if there's only a fixed amount of space between your, the two bones of your foot, the thicker that gets, um, the more space it's taking up and the less compression of those bones it takes to achieve more pressure, more irritation, right? Like if something's thicker, it's going to be squeezed harder with the same amount of pressure. So, you know, it does take time for a neuroma to really resorb, right? Like you can go in and get foot surgery and get some of that extra material scraped off, but that, you know, slicing the skin of your foot open and your fascia carries its own risks. So if you remove the, the thing that's causing it, it will resorb over time. But in the meantime, if you wear, you might, your tolerance to unnatural footwear may have significantly decreased. And so your risk, uh, your risk reward of like, is it worth wearing these cute heels to the wedding? Well, if my risk is I might be in debilitating foot pain for three days, uh, I don't know if it is right. It's a personal decision. But I think if people knew that that's sometimes a trade-off that's being made without realizing it, they might reevaluate, you know, and find like a moderate looking pair of shoes that isn't super compressive, um, mm -hmm. which there's more and more options available. Like go to Anya's time. reviews on Instagram. So many cute shoes on his reviews. There you go. <laughs> so, so yeah, be aware of that. If you have an aroma, it takes a while for that thickening area to resorb. And the trade-off is compressive footwear might, you might be more, much more sensitive to compressive footwear than you may have formerly been. So. And then FYI. if you get the, and if you get the surgery too, and then you just don't ever change the behaviors, you're, you're just always in a world of a cyclical pattern, right? Yeah. And actually the surgery itself creates a lot of scar tissue that makes the, <laughs> that increases pressure between the bones anyway. So it's like a super weird, the world of medicine is just incentivized to intervene and it's inconvenient to realize that sometimes the intervention is worse than the problem. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it can be, you can get rid of it conservatively. You just had to do the right thing, right? Everyone is like so many people get um, injections for neuromas. And it's like, I'm going to wear the same types of shoes that are causing this. I'm just going to inject away the pain and the pain's going to come back, surely, because I haven't done anything to stop the pain. And it's going to be worse because I just numbed out the increased louder signal from that pain with this thing. And it's like, you know, those people don't want to be in pain. Sometimes people literally aren't being told that this is what's actually causing it. And by doing this, you're actually not solving it and you might make it worse, you know, but it'll make you feel good for like, you know, whatever X amount of period yeah. of time. Yeah. <laughs> make you feel good for eight seconds, but you're gonna be miserable for a year. So. Um, that's it with neuromas. So open Q and a, we got, uh, 26 more minutes. So we've got plenty of time. If people that are tuned in live don't have questions, we, I believe have people that have submitted questions, but this is basically our once a month open forum for connecting with the community and, uh, answering questions as best we can. Although we, you know, specific answers we don't give because I don't think they're actually meaningful. 
uh, but pointing people in the direction of what experiments they can try or things that they can learn. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited about the golden rules. I think this is a very, like I was away for a couple of weeks and I really wanted to focus on understanding like what is the essence of everything we've learned? Uh, and I think the golden rules as they stand now are a good start, might be modified over time. I don't, I don't know how I, you know, the four hours of sitting um, is still a decent amount of time sitting in a chair. But I think for the average person, that's not, four hours is not very much if they include all sitting like meals, commuting in a car, plane, train, work, um, a lot of, lot of, a lot of chair sitting. So I think it, what it does is brings awareness. Like, can I get it to four hours or less? And if I am sitting, get up and move every 30 minutes, that's a big game changer. That is an, that is, I think that would probably be the most underrated golden rule because it is so important for whole body health, mental health, because when you're moving your brain, your brain is just your brain biologically function functions better if you are moving frequently throughout the day. Um, so there's a lot of like little sneaky elements to that. If you can really move towards that heuristic, but, um, yeah, open questions. Anyone, anyone? Sue, Sue has a, Sue has a hand raised there. Amazing. <laughs> Sue, go for it. Um, hi. Um, oh, I just take my hand off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I sent in a question because my husband um, had uh, cancer of a stomach uh, five years ago and he had a lot of chemotherapy and he was left with um, uh, hands that felt like, um, well, he couldn't feel them, although that has got better slowly. But his feet remain exactly the same. It feels like he's walking on cushions. He has no hardly any sensation on the bottom of his feet and um i was just talking to him about um just some videos i'd watched for, of yours and i just wondered whether you had any um experience of people with that kind of condition who have made any movement with that because he he does walk, walk barefoot a lot but he does sit a lot but he he just says nothing's changed in the five years. He just can't feel anything. So I just wondered what he thought. Yeah, um, I've worked with people with neurological deficits, um, different, but also similar, like whether it's diabetic neuropathy or uh, post post stroke even sometimes. And I think the fundamental mechanism of like low richness of sensory um, fidelity, like being able to feel fine textures, fine little movements, the same principle applies. And number one, our nerve systems are incredibly plastic. And so it does change over time. It might change slower as we get older. It might be very gradual, but nerves do um, change dynamically over time. What I would always give is progressive um, increases in sensory stimulation. So that can be things like, like texture is a really big one, right? So different textures on the ground. Um, temperature can also be a big one, right? Like hot, cold, like what, what things can you do to send sensory input into this system and stimulate the nerves to be able to respond or interpret that, those signals, right? Um, once again, I don't, you know, I don't know what ceiling people re reach in terms of how much of that can they reclaim, but I've never seen anyone that didn't make progress if they did something consistently, um, and yeah, like even, even getting him to do, um, active motor stuff, like trying to move individual toes one at a time, uh, trying to splay his toes, getting his hands on his feet or having someone get their hands on his feet and just like moving the, just gentle mobilization, right? Move the foot in all these weird wonky ways, as long as they don't give pain nerve or, or movement of the joints of the bones and all the muscles and pressure on the muscles is so much sensory input into the system that it oftentimes will, you know, circuits will plug back in usually if they're given a reason to be there. And I think most people just lose totally sen total sensory abilities in their feet because we have literally deprived them of any sensory input. And so why would the brain maintain the ability to perceive sensory elements um, if it perceives that the foot no longer lives in an environment with sensory input ever, right? Like the inside of a shoe. So yeah, I think once you really, and, and really try different things, you know, like, like I said, different textures, different temperatures, different movements, um, different pressures, all that kind of stuff. 
So yeah, hopefully that helps you, Sue. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. Can I chime in on this one as well? Yes, go for it. Yeah, so uh, I actually work a lot with cancer patients um, who have been on chemotherapy. So with the post-chemo neuropathies, um, you know, loss of sensation in the hands and feet are really, really common. So I think Nick really touched on a lot of the things that I typically do for, for my clients to, that do have neuropathies. Um, what, one of the, the other things that I like to do is I'll take things like feathers and, and different textures and actually apply it with my, my hands and uh, just apply, apply it to the bottom of your foot and really expose yourself to as many different textures as pos possible. So get cotton balls, uh, get feathers, get cloth, get, get anything you can think of. Um, some people use Legos, but obviously be mindful of like, <laughs> be mindful <laughs> of the risk for injury as well but as much texture as you can. And then, yeah, use your hands to manipulate as well. One of the things I also like to do is like, I'll take my hands and just kind of pat the bottom of my feet to help promote blood flow. Yeah. Um, and then one other recommendation I would have is just to take a look at your diet as well. You may want to consult like a, a nutritionist to help you with this or a naturopathic doctor who, who's well-versed in this, um, but foods that help promote circulation, such as beets that are really high in nitric oxide that can help promote blood flow as well. So, so changing up the diet and having good hydration. So making sure you're drinking lots of water so that the blood can move through the body. And then can I just add one other question slash possibility, which is that you said he, he sits a lot, right? And so it's, <laughs> once again, it's kind of comes back to the cycle of discomfort. So we don't want to move because maybe we can't feel the feet or the, the problems, but if you move the whole body more, you're going to obviously move more blood flow to the extremities. So I'm wondering like if you could, if he could, you know, try to get his body moving more, like just getting down on the ground and then standing up and then getting down on the ground again, or I don't know what his mobility level is, but it seems like it's good. If, yeah. if I were, if I were dealing with um, that type of feeling in my feet, I would want to move my hips more. I would want to move, you know, just move the whole body around more. Thank you. And thank you, Emily. Thank you. Emily's a foot nerd. And she's also a nurse. So got a <laughs> yes. bunch of foot nerds here today. Yep. Okay. Anybody else want to, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question uh, with neuromas. I do have some clients with neuromas and I find it challenging to find a nice balance between resting and movement because they do have a difficult time loading and, and weight bearing on their feet. And I, I find it difficult to just help them find that balance. Uh, do you have any recommendations for, for how to approach that? Good question. Jason, I don't know. I just saw Jason raise his hand. I don't know. I'll maybe it. jump in before you, if that's all right, Nick. Go for it. Uh, I, there's some, some things I was going to add on neuromas. It comes from uh, Dr. Connolly. She was kind of recently sharing an experiment on uh, Gate Happens. It was called an anatomical study of Morton's inter interdigital neuroma, the relationship between the occurring site and the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. So uh, I used to be super naive when I first started out being a foot nerd because I was like, you know, natural all the way as flat as you can you got to feel all this stuff i've recently tried looking or opening my mind a little bit to more uh thicker soled shoes with the same principles of still being widespread sp uh, wide splay uh etc and then making all the other the other four f's for the most part but with maybe a little bit thicker of a sole so what interesting that came out of this experiment in 2007 was that uh, we used to kind of think that between digits three and four of the toe, that that uh, those bundle of nerves are getting kind of caught under that uh, DTML, or that deep transverse metatarsal ligament. What some new research is kind of saying is that it's more so between the proximal phalanx and so like if I have a, this right here instead of in between digits three and four more so, it's more in between these joints if you can kind of see. So during that propulsion of gait and going into the windless mechanism sort of a thing, really causing people's problems. So like what they were saying is instead before they prescribe those like uh, 
metatarsal Met pads, pads, little circular pads right here, uh, as opposed to maybe more of like an interdigital pad. So what they were saying is like, if the pads like this cut out the pad, so it's uh, like this rather, sorry. So that here you have pressure, but these toes are floating so that you're able to still kind of walk a little bit more pain-free so that these toes aren't going into extension these ones still can sort of a thing. So it might be that bridge between trying to walk and get some healthy movement in without um, exhausting those toes or where that neuroma is. Again, acting as a crutch, trying to not rely on that and get healthier and keep moving sort of a thing. But that might be a good thing to help people's motivation, keep walking pain-free and stuff. I thought it was really interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think it really emphasizes the importance of like, how do we teach people the principles of auto regulation? Like how do we help people understand how much is too much? How much is just right? How much is I can be doing more? And it's so, it's so incredibly, you know, nuanced with every single person and it's so hard, right? And, and really the goal is like to help people understand how to do that so that they don't have to constantly refer to the knowers to tell them how much they're do when they're doing too much, too little. And, you know, part of it, I think, is really contextualizing pain. It's like, well, what, it, what is pain? Is pain something to be feared or something to be scared of? How much pain can I work through? And I think for me, it boils down to really taking down good notes of like, because oftentimes there's these delayed things, right? It's like you, it feels really good. You do a bunch, doesn't hurt you at the time, and then you pay for it in a big way. And it's like, that would always happen when I was recovering from injury. And I think that is the ebb and flow of figuring out like, okay, well, that's part of the lesson of how do I know if I'm doing too much or too little, or I can do more. And it's tricky because whenever you determine that you, <laughs> your body changes and now you can do more. So it's like trying to play with that is just, you know, if you were debilitated because you did too much, then do less. Um, if it was within your tolerance, um, then you did an okay amount. And if you wish to push further, you can try and do more. But that's a really, it's a tricky question. Um, yeah. And I want to just, I want to talk about like nervous system stress, you know, like pain that is, that, that kind of like comes with fear. I mean, I know we've talked about this before, but I'm really recognizing and trying to go deeply into this. Like, I realize that I have been a foot nerd for a long time and I've been an athlete for a long time and a mover for my whole life. And dealing with chronic pain is like, I'm finally starting to really give true um, recognition to how much my body starts to stress in protection mode, like, and all of the little pain triggers, like hams, old hamstrings, like just a sense of like fear, my body just goes into protection mode and the nervous system just gets over stimulated. And lately I've been working with like relaxation techniques when I'm trying to, and I want to move a lot. So like if I, I, I mean, most of my foot nerd friends know I love tennis. I want to play tennis and I want to play tennis for the rest of my freaking life. And I'm in my fifties and I get so scared that I'm not going to be able to do that. But like, as I get on the court and I'm doing all the right things, like I'm doing the health kit, I'm doing foot nerd training, I'm doing all the stuff, <laughs> man. And then I get on the court and I'm like, oh no, is it gonna hurt? And so lately I've been working like really, really with meditation and mindfulness and like, like talking with my nervous system, which sounds weird, but it's not, it's super important. I think it sounds pretty um, important. <laughs> and telling my hamstrings, it's okay to relax. You're going to be able to run so freaking fast to get that ball. And I'm not even kidding. Like in the last two days I've had more, I mean, I'm still doing all the things. My beam training is exquisite. Like the working on the beam is so awesome, but, um, you know, not discounting about talking with our nervous system and our muscles and our bodies and remembering that they're designed to receive instruction from us. So if you tell it, your body that it's safe and that you're going to stop before the pain is dangerous, and we know the difference between dangerous pain and pain that is like, okay, we're going slow. You can trust me. I won't hurt you body. Yeah. Amazing tool that I get to use for the rest of my life. I think it's important to address the psychological and sort of mindfulness meditation nervous system dialogue yeah that's a great consideration for sure yeah even breathing i mean breathing can desensitize it's like if your nervous system threshold is so close to like just 
firing off, popping off hard, then like a little bit of pain can actually feel insanely brutal. Um, and yeah, that's a really good point of just like breathing to like settle your system down so that the pain gets put into perspective. And even just knowing, like if you know that's just an irritated area and you're not doing physical damage and your body is gonna restore itself. It's like, you know, I used to have people come into the clinic with knee pain, they didn't know what it was. They had some big diagnosis applied to them. Their running was at, at, at in jeopardy and they were just like a mess. Like they were really not doing well. And without even touching their knee or doing anything, we would just go through like, do you actually understand what's happening here? Do you understand that like your knee joints irritated because you sit and you can't use your hips. So your knees doing all this work when you run and it's getting overwhelmed. And if we just get your hips back in the game, your knees going to be fine. You're going to be able to run. Their pain went way down. Their whole body went into like a different state because there was no longer this like ephemeral threat that they didn't understand. They didn't have to be scared of it. It was, I understand this. I trust that I'm going to be able to do the right thing. And you know, we got this and it would just, it's crazy what that can do to just your whole system, let alone some sort of pain and irritation that could be catastrophic or it could be nothing, but until you know the difference, it's assumed catastrophic always. Mm -hmm. so, and we don't get sense. the, and we don't get the message that we are a self healing machine. You know, we don't get the message. We get the message that you're designed to break down and it just keeps getting worse and worse until you're relegated to the recliner, you know? Right. Um, so I think it's important to, and then the breathing is, I mean, what the first thing that I see in my yoga classes immediately when people come to an evening class after driving in traffic is that they're not, we're not, we don't breathe. And the minute that we get fearful about pain, we stop the breath. So I think you bring up a really good point about how important breath work is. Awesome. So it looks like Eric, welcome. We're we're in the Q and A portion. Did you want? Did anybody else have questions? Because we have like ten minutes, eight minutes left of the call, and we we obviously prioritize the people who join us for questions. So if you have something for us, we'd love to hear. Yeah, I did. Um, I think it's more just general guidance. It's a little backstory here. Um, so I've definitely recognized the importance of of the hip, knee, foot, all the connection. And um, I've definitely been trying, starting on my journey on that, got a beam, like trying to wear like shoes with wide toe splays. And and um, I guess where I found myself is that um, I kind of got off, off the routine for a while and then tried to get back into it. And I feel like I um, kind of strained my left Achilles a bit. And so, uh, it was bothering me for a while and I recognized like, Hey, I need some help. Went to physical therapy and, you know, started working on that. And, um, one of the recommendations was like, Hey, get some arch support cause your foot's collapsing in. And I had a big trip where I was going to be walking a lot. I was like backpacking in Europe. So I had limited shoes that I could bring. And so I was like, all right, I've tried these arch support shoes. They're helping. I can get through this trip. And then kind of go from there and I think what I did is because I went from having more minimalist shoes to having shoe with a lot of support I was able to walk a lot I basically gave myself a stress fracture is what it seems to be and so I'm kind of in this realm where I know that like long term what I need to do is build up that tolerance and just expose some of these areas to movement um, but I'm I guess what I was curious if you had recommendations on how to how to balance that because you go to a podiatrist and they're like hey put it in a boot to protect it and that makes sense for the stress fracture but then you know also they're telling me for the achilles which is the other foot like you might have to wear uh heel lifts or this for the rest of your life basically and i'm like i don't agree with that part but i do agree with i need to put my foot in a boot to like heal the bone and so i guess i was trying to I'm, I'm pretty early in that process. Like I've been in the boot for about a week and I'm trying to balance what I pick up from, you know, seeing you guys on Instagram or listen to podcasts or just like my own research. And then these like medical professionals who um, are giving me certain advice and like how to take certain pieces from people who are looking at scans and saying like, we need to heal this. And then also discarding pieces where I don't believe that I, need to wear art support for the rest of my life. I think I need to train up to it. And so how to balance like listening to the recommendations of professionals and then also being like, I'm gonna go do 
my own thing and how to yeah any guidance around that because it's it's frustrating and i i know what to do but i also i don't want to go on these appointments and be like yeah that's thanks for the advice i'm not going to do that so yeah yes that is the ultimate teeter-totter of balancing things yeah um, and i think i mean i think starting by arming yourself with just the print first principles like if you're armed with those it's way easier to see the outliers of things you're being told to do that doesn't align with you know what you're trying to accomplish and these first principles of how the body adapts and works right um you know we know that a stress fracture will heal itself as long as it's given the opportunity to do so um typically the boot is like you're gonna have work to do after that's healed it's better to make sure the bone has healing with integrity has healed with integrity that is like priority if you rank it hierarchically that's first because if it doesn't you're going to have a longer period of time where you can't do as much and it's going to take you longer so and then like you said is you know it sounds like you have a really good understanding of things like i i think you know you know there's nothing i could tell you specifically of what to do other than trust that your body is really really powerful at healing itself i think one thing people underestimate is the effect that the other pillars have on 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 the physical body like you know if you're getting good sleep if you're eating good food if you have a good mindset related to this entire process you're not getting bogged down in like you know frustration and you're really taking a positive outlook like this is gonna this is gonna be fine i'm gonna get through this i'm gonna work on this as tolerated you know with a boot it's like taking your boot off and just like moving your foot regularly right? Maybe not even walking or moving without it, but, you know, doing whatever the specialist says, because they're the ones that have seen your scan. They know the degree of stress fracture. They know the best with that. Um, but, you know, even just asking the question, like, what is the boot for? Um, and asking them, because some will say it's to restrict movement. Some will say it's to restrict vibration. Some will say it's just to put something, it's to put a ball and chain on your leg so you don't do shit so that you yeah. let it heal, uh, which I think is probably the biggest reason. Um, you know, we give these little knickknacks far too much credit for these magical powers they're doing it's like really it's usually the behavioral element that these things are are really achieving um and when you ask why it's like okay well if you don't want me slam if you don't want the impact forces of me stepping on it all day without any protection then can i take the boot off like every 30 minutes and move my toes around and curl you know pick up a hacky sack or whatever and a lot of times I say yeah yeah that's totally cool um it's case dependent, right? Some people just love binaries where it's like, you, you come, you must do nothing. And I think those are, it's like, there's probably more detail there than, than you might know. Um, and it's just self-regulating based on how you feel, right? Like how does your body feel? Does it feel better when you're doing these movements? Um, overall in terms of the trend, like is the discomfort and the pain, um, getting reducing, um, you know, when you go back and get a follow-up x-ray and whatever it is, six weeks, that'll give you a really good piece of data as well to see like, you know, I did all these things and it healed well. And now I have the gall clear to work on the finer tuned adaptations. So I think it's just self-regulation, asking questions, to the people who are giving you prescriptions and, and knowing enough yourself to ask good questions, um, I think is really important. I think people don't know the right questions to ask and that it does, it just doesn't leave you as involved with your care and leaves you with these binaries when in reality, there's probably a lot more gray in the middle that gives you a ton of flexibility to do things without um, overstepping the constraints you've been given. Um, so I don't know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of stuff there. Eric, I have two questions for you. Okay. okay. The first question is, did you know before you went on that backpacking trip, the possibility um that you would be in this position now like when you were kind of ge gearing up to do this I'm asking because like whenever my will and my ego override like the best thing for the body I end up in situations where I'm a in a little tougher situation and then the second question is was the backpacking trip worth what you're going through now um so I think in hindsight what I recognize my problem was is that I was given the arch support shoes and not really armed with breaking them in. And it also mm -hmm. was like right before my trip. And because mm -hmm. I had limited space, I basically just had the shoes and that was like what I had. So I didn't really know, I guess I, I knew at the time that it would be detrimental to getting full movement in my Achilles or foot, but it would like work enough for the mm -hmm. trip. I didn't realize that um, I would be basically 
marching myself into a stress fracture. So I didn't know that whole thing, but mm -hmm. halfway through the trip, I started feeling it. And I was like, mm -hmm. so to answer your second question, it was worth it. But at the same time, like it was my fear going in. It was kind of something that was like, am I just going to hurt myself more going on this trip? I'm happy mm -hmm. I did the trip, but now mm -hmm. I'm annoyed that I marched myself into this yeah. situation. And then coming back, it was like, not really sure what the, um, what I had done, if it was like, should, that's where I finally went to the diatrist. Cause I was like, I know a little bit, but I don't know enough how to get out of this current situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how I found out it was a stress fracture, but I, based off just mental notes, I, had, it fits everything I had assigned to it just without knowing the diagnosis. Gotcha. I don't know if I answered your question. You but. did. Thanks yeah. for answering went, those. Those are good. Those are yeah. juicy questions, Ruth. <laughs> well, because they're juicy and I was a little scared to ask, but, but the thing is, is like Jeff Shubb, who is another foot nerd who rocked my world with a question, well, a statement, but I was recalling when I had, I think I had maybe two minor hamstring strains and I was supposed to go on this uh, weekend, um, like Cobb house building workshop where we essentially were throwing mud and I was just work and I just kept telling myself, yeah, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But I just had those niggling injuries that just got worse and worse. And in hindsight, it was worth it. But when I reflect on my experience, like all I have is like kind of bad memories about being in pain. Um, and then Jeff said, told me, said something on a call we were having once he was talking about like the, the natural shoes and being keep us honest, right? So like, if you can't do the thing that you want to do in the shoes that are going to be the healthiest for your feet, like I was talking about playing tennis in, in our FCs at the time, that, yeah. um, that it's more ego. And then like, you're not, you're not really paying attention to the health of your body so much as you're like, will it, you're letting your will take over and do that thing. And so that's just a question I've had to ask myself recently, like, what is worth it to me? Like what is yeah. truly worth it? And those are tough questions, but I think worth worth reflecting on. And yeah. they're good trade-offs. I mean, I've done things that I knew weren't good for my health that were very much worth doing. And you know, you you have the extra challenge of working those things out of your body after. But um, yeah, as long yeah, as people know the trade-offs, right? Totally. And that's that was part of it. Is like there was this thought going into it, like. I didn't know what would happen, but then partway through the trip and like, it kind of started where it felt like there was like a rock underneath my big toe. And that was, and I'd take my shoe off. I'm like, there's a rock there. What the heck is this? And then mm -hmm. it progressively got a little worse, but I was like in Ireland and we had That's planned beautiful. to walk the cliffs of more. And like, I wasn't going to not do that. So I'm yeah, glad yeah, I did yeah. it. But yeah. at the same time, the part way through, I'm just like, I started, I would like walk backwards a little bit to try and take some off. And I was just like, I, I'm doing this and I'll deal with whatever the consequences. But exactly. yeah, if I was at home, I wouldn't have done it as much. But I do think that ego level is something that I deal with is like, I know for myself, if I'm in a situation where someone's like, can you do this? I'm going to do it. <laughs> I will damn well <laughs> <Right>? try. <laughs> yeah. So I have to like remove myself from the situation usually so that I don't get in that like stubbornness ego level to then just power through it yeah i also find it very interesting that mechanism because when your foot is unable the foot is a beautiful shock absorptive mechanism right like the 33 um 23 bones 33 joints is a huge amount of articulation to distribute any loads or impact forces throughout just the foot itself not even talking about the ankles which is pretty incredible and it's interesting that when your foot cannot absorb impact loads cannot absorb vibrations or um or just like impact forces, um, those impact forces go to the skeleton instead of being absorbed by the muscles and joint articulations. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that that is, it's like when you put something, when you wear rigid footwear, um, your bones take the brunt of it. And it's just so, um, you know, once you kind of look at it from that, once you understand how crazy what the foot does is, it makes perfect sense. And I mean, you'll heal from a stress fracture. You'll be just as strong as you were before. It's just like these little lessons that it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. And then <laughs> well, I'm like, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that's where, that's where like we, like you were saying, Nick was saying, like you're armed with the first principles knowledge, which is that we are self-healing. And like you said, like, who's not going to see that beautiful place that you saw while you were walking, but maybe 
Um, and then just knowing that like, well, now it's time to heal and get serious about it. Yeah. And I'm trying to, I guess the last question, I don't, don't want to hog it all, but is how you would recommend approaching the post boot era, if you will. So like, I know the podiatrist will want me to wear something to take some of the pressure off the Achilles and, you know, so, something with less heel, with more heel, I, I forget what order, not zero heel drop basically. And if you would recommend like, or I guess if you've seen with other patients and stuff is, should I start with a bit of a heel lift to get into it and then slowly take it away or just like go for it and then do zero heel, heel lift, but lower exposure to it and build up that way. Yeah. Start with less and then add if needed, you know, people love people that get paid to tell you, you need to add something, tell you to add first, then subtract. But really it's like, start like, don't underestimate your body. I would start with nothing auto regulate really well. Take notes every day. If something's bothering you, you know, if the calf tension is bothering you, here's something people don't realize. Like you can work on your calf tissues to reduce pressure on the Achilles without lifting your heel up right without like putting yourself out of that tension position you just got to reduce some of the tension in your calf muscle so it's like heel lift calf tissue work calf tissue work you'll be able to yeah. you'll be just fine and then just self-regulate don't do too much you're inevitably gonna have times where you do too much and that's the lesson to kind of like swing back so yeah just self-regulate cool. and take good thank notes. you you're welcome yeah. thank you all all right, let's wrap it up. It's 236. This was a great call. Thank you everyone who attended. Thanks for everyone who asked great questions and engaged and um, gave us your attention for the past 66 minutes. Uh, we are going to post this on YouTube after a couple days um, so that you can watch it again if you want to review something or so that other people can watch it. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of TFC and we will catch you all on the next community call in November. I'm not sure when the date is yet, but it's on the tfcfootnerd.com website, the community calls tab. It'll have the Zoom link there and the date for the next one. And then if we have a focal topic, it'll list that as well. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Ruth, for organizing this and all the nerds for coming out. Yep. Thanks for taking care of yourself, nerds. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao.